ever. Got it. Thank you so much, Emma. And welcome, everybody. It's so lovely to see you all. Feel free to turn on your cameras. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Laura, Head of Play. And we are really delighted to see you all. Um, Lisa, uh, let's hear your voice. Introduce yourself. Hi there, everybody. I'm Lisa. Pleasure to meet you all again. Um, working at Leeds as a Therapeutic and Specialist Play Manager. I'm really excited to join you today um, and share some practice and ideas and learn from each other. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I know. I think what, what worked really well last time we all met is that um, we made it really clear at the beginning that this is a, a collaborative session and there are so many amazing uh, practitioners in the room, people with great ideas and things to share. And that's really important to us uh, together. So um, we just really are very welcoming if you've got something to say at any point you can unmute yourself and join in isn't that right Lisa absolutely yeah chip in join in very informal munch away on your sandwiches do yeah. whatever you need to do to get comfortable yeah um the the topic we, we sort of the the sort of stimulation for today's session is thinking about getting outside when you can't get outside and I thought that I would uh, kick off with a bit of inspiration that we have worked with an amazing um, organization recently called Art Imprints. Um, and they are a group, an artistic um, collaborative uh, led by dance artist uh, Anne Colvine. And I wanted to share this with you because it's something, there's something really beautiful about the sense of um, being in oneself and landing where you are and conjuring up in your mind and in your senses somewhere that you would really want to be, particularly um, important for children who are in hospital because um, even though we make hospital, Lisa, don't we, an amazing, an amazing place to be, so with all the kind of joy that we can possibly muster up, um, but for most people, it's not somewhere they, they would choose to go. And so um, I shared some pictures with Emma. I don't know if you could get them up. Just it's, an, it's a, a, a project that anybody can, can access. And this is just an example of some of the sort of um, uh, inspiring sort of tactile sensory materials uh, that we were sort of provided with um, to just to start things off really. And the idea is that it's an online um, platform where people are sharing either real or imagined amazing places uh, that they would like to be. It's got a connection to biophilia. So this idea that, that as humans, we're attracted to things that are alive and, um, and, and nature, accepting that we are a part of nature as we're alive. Um, and the, there are sort of three maps on this online platform. We can share the details later. Um, it's just a, a fantastic um, sort of collaborative effort. I don't know if anybody on the call who's had anything to do with um, My Fantastic Place would like to sort of share their experiences and uh, not singling anybody out, but I know there are a few. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, Laura. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so we've had a, a couple of patients take part in the project and use um, the the little pack of materials that that we were provided um, to actually create their My Fantastic Place. So it could either be sort of like inspired by those materials or they can actually use those materials and being within a hospital space with a limited access to to staff, um, they've actually all utilised what they've what they've been given to create their own my fantastic place. So we had an underwater adventure. We also had a patient um, who did one about the little sort of. She lives in London in the little area in her garden, which is like a little bit of a haven of natural space in the middle of this very urban area. So she sort of recognised how important that was to have a bit of greenery um, in a place that's very sort of not green um so yeah we, the project has been going on for a while and everybody can take part and i feel like it's it's a brilliant piece of work and afterwards so they can then upload it onto the website and afterwards that 
if I, my fantastic place will be there forever as long as that website exists that will be there so it's also like a lovely way to sort of leave a bit of a legacy as well um but yeah I'll put I can put the um link in the chat to let everybody get involved oh. share it out that's brilliant thanks Evelyn I mean particularly when we're thinking about sort of like low cost low resource ways to um to sort of put yourself in a space where you're feeling connected to nature you know this is this is a really great example um, in terms of in terms of other other ways of sort of co connecting to sort of sensory experiences um i don't know lisa do you have anything um that you wanted to kind of add to that yeah yeah so i suppose what i'd like to do is just um in the years that i've been a play specialist just share some of the wonderful things that we have been able to do mm -hmm. and hear the contributions maybe that you've shared with some of your uh, patients in hospital so you know everybody sees us as a large children's hospital but unfortunately you know at the moment we don't have a great outdoor space and we've been in that position for many years and Nick is on the call and can back, back me up with this um, I was fortunate to work with Nikki and talk about resourcefulness I think we've tried everything under the book um, and in the book um, so you know it is about being creative because I'm sure like many people on the call we don't have a budget there's no budget allocated for play never mind outdoor play um, so you know it is about being creative and trying to sort of use those connections and those skills you know wisely um, so I thought I would just mention a few practical things that we have done um, that have been, you know, really well received and really had some lasting memories for our children's and families. So, you know, one that we did, and I'll try and get the pictures over to you, though, but it is a little bit sensitive, so I have to be mindful with that. Um, we had a patient that was palliative, one of our oncology patients, and they were desperate, desperate to get him to the, you know, seaside. Um, to have a few hours where he could play with a bucket and spade because he's never been to the seaside, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine the story, you know, it, it, it was quite, you know, very sad. And we were based with, you know, what can we do about this? Well, he's not well enough. He can't go to the seaside, you know, what we're going to do. Anyway, the play team, you know, delivered the seaside to him and that's what we actually did we put big pieces of plastic on the floor we bought bags and bags of sand we had shells we had water we had buckets we had spades um you know we really went all out um you know we even had ice creams um you know on the beach we really went all out and really created you know this wonderful lasting memory um for these you know this family and the siblings you know on the ward um, and you know I still see them now and they talk about that you know we didn't get to the seaside but we did you know so I think it's about you know being creative and thinking well how are we going to make this happen and you know we did make that happen and that is just one of you know many examples I can recall another one um, where you know it was snowing outside the child was desperate to go outside. Unfortunately, the child wasn't well enough to go outside. So, you know, between us, we carried the water tray outside and we filled it up with snow and we had snowball fights and we made a snowman, you know, in the hospital um, and things like that. So I'm trying to share with you just a couple of examples that, you know, highlight that nothing isn't possible. Um, as I say, we currently don't have an outdoor play area. It's something that we're working on. And I think with COVID and restricted visiting and things like that, it's something that at Leeds we're pushing more to get um, because it's a space where, you know, not only can you play, but you can obviously meet siblings and loved ones and, you know, things like that. So I just wanted to share a couple of examples. I've got a list, but I don't want to go on. Um, that, you know, we have no dedicated outdoor play area here at the Children's Hospital, but we're trying to be creative to bring play 
that should happen outdoors and be resourceful and make that happen. So I'm going to put something out really and say, has anybody done anything similar, um, you know, where they have really gone, you know, a little bit, you know, off tangent, if you like, to create an outdoor experience indoor, whether that be for a child in hospital or a nursery setting that they're willing to share today, please. Have we got many people on from, you know, working in hospitals? Yes, I work at Lewisham Hospital. Hello, thank you for contributing today. That's Please share right. with us. Um, and I um, had a child that wanted to go for a walk in the woods and kick, kick up the leaves. Wonderful. Um, wanted to do it in bare feet. So I was like, okay. So we just, I just went out and got loads of leaves basically. Um, I made sure I washed them, which he wasn't very happy with at first, but I thought because we wanted to do the bare feet bit, I was going to make sure they were going to be washed a bit. Um, yeah, so we just did that basically. We just brought the woods in, inside. And he helped, we, we, um, we drew some trees. We, we got some cardboard and we drew some trees. And um, then we just made all the leaves around. Oh, around so the Amazing. The beauty, the beauty of cardboard as well. You know what you what you can do with cardboard. Amazing, the, isn't it? Fantastic, fantastic example, Michelle. Yeah, and what a difference that will have made. You know, you made his walk in the woods happen in hospital. I wow. know it's lovely at fault, isn't it? You get yeah. quite emotional, don't you? It's like, oh, actually, <laughs> yeah, we can make anything happen. Yeah, of course we can. Thank you, Michelle. That's absolutely just the kind of thing that, you know, we need to be talking about and sharing. So, you know, thank you. Has anyone okay. else got anything else that they be willing to contribute or share? Because, you know, I think that's just an absolute, you know, shining example. While you're thinking about it, I'll give you another one. Um, so, you know, it was a very hot day. I'm quite good at blagging things for free. I seem to have the gift of the gab. And, you know, it was really, really warm. And, you know, this was pre-COVID. COVID has put a lot of dampers on things. And, you know, lots of the children were saying, can I have an ice cream? Can I have an ice cream? And we were like, well, we don't even have a freezer on some of the wards. So I managed to blag this wonderful ice cream van that came outside the children's hospital and played his lovely ice cream music. And one by one, all the children came out and got an ice cream. Um, you know, and we even blagged them for the staff as well. Uh, and to me, that was, you know, one of the highlights of, it's making me quite emotional, actually, of, of one of my best achievements. I know I'm the therapeutic and specialist play manager, um, but, you know, that was one of my, you know, best achievements, seeing these children line up, you know, and going away with an ice cream just made such a small difference, you know, to their day. So beautiful. There's another beautiful. one. Beautiful, yeah. I remember that, Lisa, because I missed out. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, did you want to add something? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different, but um, there's an exercise I've been doing. I've just just literally done it, so I was late. Actually, was with a with a group with, with adults actually, but um, it's just been an exercise in kind of like mapping your local area, um, and it's basically playing it out. So you kind of draw out the local area where you live, so you, you, where you, you might put your house and maybe your school and, and, a, and a play area nearby. And you sort of draw that out and then you add in some playful things like something to explore, something to change and a hiding place. And then you place yourself into it. So then if you're doing that, um, you, you know, you might just take anything around the house like a screw or a pen lid or a bit of plasticine or something and you place yourself into it. And literally you're just creating like the world that you kind of live in. And it could be, I mean, I've done that with people with their local area, but I've also done it with like a place that brings you joy. So you might just think of a holiday place or a place that you really, really love and take three elements to kind of like map it out in a really simple way. Then place yourself in it. And once you're in it, then you can then explore around that and you can start to play. You can go and hide in your hiding place. You can bring a friend into it. You can bring a stranger into it. You can then change something around that and you can start to think and, you know, it takes quite a lot, of, it can take quite a lot of care around it. It can kind of bring up some emotional things into it, depending on the context. But it's more of that kind of just going into a world and just imagine, it's more from an imagination sort of point of view of kind of exploring and kind of playing into an outdoor space um, or kind of within your head, but it's taking you into that. And particularly if you're having to engage with 
children online, that's sort of where a lot of it had come from, really, where you're having to do things on a Zoom thing where it's tangible and you've got things in your hands, but you can take take things into into another place. That's been a really nice exercise I've found, I'd say, really effective with adults and children. Thank you, Malcolm. Nikki, go for it. Let's hear you. Um, I, was, I wasn't sure that to say it or not because it's slightly different, I suppose. But when I was on the teenage cancer unit, so it's a 13 to 18s, um, we had a lot of patients that always ended up being in every year, especially leukemia ones, just happened to be on bonfire night and they were getting so frustrated they were missing out on doing bonfire night. So where our um, teenage cancer unit is in relation to then the bone marrow transplant unit, in between there's this awful little courtyard that's in between. Um, so it took a lot of jiggling around. We, bought just, we just got some sparklers and we had to have a nurse on hand for drip stands. You have to have a states on hand because obviously you've got an explosive on site. Um, all these different things put in place just to be able to walk out into a little courtyard and with his brother do sparklers so obviously it's not inside but it is because it's a courtyard that you have to access from inside to outside and nobody else can yeah. get to it and it was just something that we wanted to do with uh, some of our younger teenage patients great nikki thank you that's really great yeah i miss you nikki me and nikki used to work together she's moved on to bigger and better things now oh, jody around jody go for it please share hi um my name's jody i'm a play worker at gosh um, a couple of years ago, so pre-COVID times, um, on my ward, we were celebrating play day and we went for the theme of a beach day um, because it's something obviously a lot of our children are missing out on and is a lot of fun for a lot of people. So we had a really large space and uh, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing day. We, we had a huge, what was normally used as a water tray that we filled with sand and baby oil. Um, sorry, flour and baby oil to make a sand because we're not allowed to have normal sand. Um, and it was this really huge tray and just all of our babies stripped them down to their nappies, plonked them in this tray with their parents kind of sitting around the outside. And yeah, it was just, you know, I didn't know how it was going to feel, but actually really replicated that feeling of watching children playing in the sand, making sand castles. Um, the play specialist that I work with was uh, created an ice cream stall in the corner. Luckily, we we did have access to a freezer, so we kind of made ice creams up for staff in the corner. Um, we did like hoopla games. We did hook a duck, all like in a in a big paddling pool of water. So yeah, you can definitely bring those materials inside, and it really created that atmosphere in a different way. But yeah, it was great. Lovely, Jodie. Well, Jodie, thanks so much for sharing that. I remember that. And not only was um, was Jenny the ice cream lady, you know, just serving ice cream, but she actually she used to dress up and made it into a little, um, you know, kiosk. Oh, it was a fan fantastic. Thanks so much for reminding us about that. Sean, I can see you've got your hand up. Please share. Hi, everyone. So my, my share is slightly different. So... Um, Prior to joining Great Ormond Street, I worked um, in palliative care. And um, one of the hospices that I was working at, there was a side room um, and a young man was um, receiving respite care in that side room. But the side room's window looked out onto a wall. So there was no outlook for this young man at all. And he, he loved trees. He loved to hear the sound of the trees and he loved to see the colours of the trees. So um, I took a camera, went outside, took loads of photographs of the trees in different, in different kind of directions. And then I brought them back in and together he created his own window frame and window scene. And it was, um, it was powerfully emotive in respect of being able to bring the family into that activity, being able for them to all be part of it. And then to, for him to use his imagination if he could choose the view, what would the view look like? And where, where would he be able to, how far would be, he be able to see? And so this wind, this creation, this window took up the entire wall of his room. We made a frame, he had mountains in the distance and it was just, just a phenomenally special time for that, that young man that we were able to do that with minimal resource, but with lots of imagination and lots of love. 
Lovely, Sharon. That leads quite nicely into something that was suggested at a patient and engagement event um, a few weeks ago, because I don't know if you know, but we're building a new children's hospital here in Leeds. And they said, and I thought, wow, that's quite simple. I don't know if you remember, you used to be able to get digital photo frames and you could run, you know, photos and things into them. And they said in each patient's room, because obviously, you know, when you're decorating the rooms, you've got to try and something that meets all ages, that doesn't offend anyone and things like that. So it was suggested by a young person and I thought it was a great idea that why don't we just have screens like photo screens on the ward? Most children or parents at least have one, you know, um, mobile phone and then you can just upload onto the screen and turn your room into whatever that might be. So you might put trees on, you might have your favorite characters on there. Obviously we'd have to think about those patients that maybe didn't have you know, the technology, but we'd have a general iPad with a backup of things. And I just thought, wow, yeah, we think so much about you know, wall art and wall glam and you know, what we should put on the walls, but actually, we shouldn't put anything on the walls. We should let the children have that choice of what they put, you know, onto the walls. And I just thought it was such a simple yeah. and great idea. So it's something we're going to push moving forward. Fantastic. That's There's such a common theme here, isn't there? It's like conjuring up these spaces that you choose, you know, choice being massively important, um, you know, bits of sort of nature, but actually what turns some body on you know is not going to be the same thing for another person so that element of you know having your your own chosen environment around you when actually you can't choose whether or not you're in yeah hospital yeah you know, that's that's a massive big deal and Kate is suggesting um virtual reality augmented reality in a similar way um and it's something that from our perspective from a hospital perspective I don't know, Lisa, if you, you would agree with this, but I, I can't imagine you wouldn't agree with this, that the, the two big um, barriers to using virtual reality in a hospital is one is Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. because typically the Wi-Fi in hospital is just patchy, let's say. Yeah. Um, and the other one is with a virtual reality headset, often you are with general, generally, you're having to choose what you're going to see from within the headset. So if you're supporting a child or a young person, you can't see what they're choosing. So it, it leaves them open to risk mm -hmm. of something else popping up and it's, it's very hard to support them. Yeah. There's a, a company that's offered us, that has said that they've solved these problems called Dr. VR. Uh, so we're going to choose an area within the hospital to test this out. And I really look forward to reporting back um, to, about how that, how that goes. Great. Claire, you've got your hand up. Please yeah. come in and then I've got something around VR to share. Cool. Claire. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, just on the, the uh, topic of VR, we um, worked with a company, I work in a museum, not a hospital, but we've worked with a company called Redbox. Um, and they do um, like either class size packs or eight packs of like a standalone VR kit. And it comes with eight headsets um, and um, you get a tablet and you can actually guide the, um, the tours or whatever yourself. Um, so so as, as the um, leader, you can see that and you can actually kind of create that. And the box has its own um, Wi-Fi connection. Mm. So wow. the, um, the, the headsets that you put in, the, the, the phones that you put in the headset and the um, tablet, are linked together and they they so i've used them like on a ship where we have like zero wi-fi um and it's and it's been really good so and they're very 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 helpful um great can you really, pop that in that chat yeah Claire? yeah i will that i'll, I'll put amazing. the link to the website they're really yeah. they're really good yeah that, that's similar to, to what dr vr are saying and um that they've done those are the, those are the solutions uh so but redbox really interested to explore that yeah thanks so much claire yeah. And again, just to follow on from the VR thing, we're working at the moment with a charity called Starlight um, and we're doing a piece of um, research. Wow. How exciting. 
Uh, so we're doing a piece of research and they're going to fund as a, a play specialist for VR for six months, which is really exciting and provide the data and the quantifying team to go with that. And we're going to look at using VR in hospital for a range of procedures and obviously, you know, um, getting some really good data um, around that. So we're quite excited, really, because, you know, as much as we'd like to do something like that, we don't have the time and the resource and they're going to help us with that and they're going to help us create, hopefully, some wonderful paper that will evidence that there, you know, is some good song points that we can use with some, not all, but with some um, procedures. So we're really excited to get that um, going, really, and see where that takes us. Lisa, that's so exciting. Yeah. So exciting. So obviously, I, we know that with VR, it's not suitable for for every situation every patient really good results so far with um, pain management um, and preparation in advance for stuff I'm so excited to see what comes out of yes. that, that's brilliant you'll be very impressed because Laura's very good at research and very academic so I can't <laughs> wait to share that with her stop smiling Nikki I can see you smiling <laughs> I can see some more hands up um, Jodie, have you still got your hand up? Sorry, or would you like to contribute further, please? Sorry, I just haven't taken it down. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it's, uh, pardon me, but I think it's Mickey. I can see your hand up. Yeah, um, so Mickey's here, but I'm, I'm with her as well, so I'm Hannah. And so um, when I was at Evelina, so as a student, um, they also had VR, they just started VR in MRI. Mm -hmm. so they had a um they just finished the research and they were publishing pub publishing sorry the app that they were using for the mri um, machine so having the vr goggles when they go into the um they'll be able to, like for prep sessions be able to see what the mri room looks like and mm -hmm. hear the sounds and everything like that so they they have it there now available so i thought i'll just let you guys know that as well thank you That's brilliant Nikki. thank you it's um I wonder if that was Dr. VR actually because they did, they did say that they've been working with the Evelina. I think um you've hit the nail on the head there, Lisa. I think when with teams like ours, where every second counts, you know, your your units of the day are just so important. And to even though we know how important research is, to actually find the extra capacity to initiate something new can just be so hard. Um so it it takes a little bit of sort of a, a leg up almost to 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 start something off and get the evidence that it works so that other people can can follow in the following you know follow in the path basically because um you can have all the amazing technology in the world but if you don't have the time and and resources to put it in place um it's really hard to do something fresh Absolutely. to do something new mm. yeah mm. lovely <laughs> I wondered if we could speak about um, a digital a little bit more because um, I don't know how everybody feels about uh, sort of digital engagement and and children. I know that often there can be a lot of neg a lot of negativity around um, children and tech and um, how that might sort of be in contrast to play and free play um, and. There's a really interesting report that the has been commissioned by a number of people, but but in the main, the Digital Futures Commission um, around free play in the digital world. And I think it's it's hugely important for us as adults to to think about. Um, yeah, that's just a, a sort of picture of it there. And I have to confess, I haven't. Um, haven't read all the way through it yet uh, but what I have read is just fascinating because it takes the elements of free play and then matches that against what would be needed for digital engagement to facilitate to to be able to be considered as free play and they've got some really amazing points in there around how children engage with the digital world in terms of hybridization and actually they're making the point there that um often children differentiate less between what is sort of physical and what's digital. They sort of do this hybridizing way of playing. Um, and particularly for us, um, where we do have constraints of space and, and freedom of movement, um, I think it li links quite nicely actually with 
how our preconceptions as adults and what we know um, can get in the way sometimes of of what we're facilitating for children and um, so I'm really looking forward to, to reading that report and trying to get my head around sort of some new ways of thinking but I wondered if anybody on the call has um, sort of any experiences of sort of worries about children and, and digital tech or or really positive stories about um about its use anybody want to share Lucy, please share thank you um so i work in an art gallery in manchester um and we've been running a program called play live which has been going for about a year now since lockdown um and it started just as a way of taking what we did we did like messy play sessions for under fives before covid and it was just a way of trying to take what we did in the gallery online mm -hmm. so we had lots of conversations like this about you know how do you still because it's very much about the sessions before covid were very much about the materials and the environment that we were creating so we were kind of creating these invitations to play rather than you know we weren't telling children what to do it was just they came in and they explored with the materials however they liked and so yeah we had lots of conversations about you know how do you how do you do that online when you don't have any materials and you don't have an environment any longer so it, it was really interesting but I think the the main thing for me that I've learned doing the online stuff is that um it's the, the children are actually it's less about the screen for the children and it's more about the, the screen for the parents, if that makes sense. So children obviously play with what's with what's in front of them and what's in the room. So really, the, what I'm finding is the play live sessions are really ideas and inspiration for the parents. So before the session, we always send out a list of materials to gather together. So like we've explored cardboard. So we just ask people to bring cardboard boxes, egg boxes, cardboard tubes. And so they would gather those things together. And then in the session, we give them prompts and suggestions of how they might play with those things. And so the children are playing with the things, you know, they don't actually need the screen at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's, the, it's for the parents, isn't it? It's, it's amazing how much parents need sort of help and hand holding with, with play sometimes. And I think by having the screen there and somebody saying, why don't you try this? or have you tried this or this works really well that seems to be how the the sort of or how i found the online sessions have, have been working so yeah i mean we've we've managed to create you know the the, the sessions have kind of snowballed as, as the pandemic's gone on and we've had like 550 people all on one call all wow playing together which is amazing you know it's sort of you're playing in your own home but you're playing together, together. with other people which just is such a special thing, really, when everybody's so isolated at home. So, yeah, mm. it, it's, it's interesting because we never thought we'd do play online, but actually by being given the opportunity, you really sort of find a lot out. And I think we'll continue to, to do a lot of work online because we've found it's a real bridge between, you know, the gallery and the community. <laughs> I have to agree with you there, Lucy, and I'll just give you an example. And you obviously, you know, sound very inspirational and you are absolutely right in what you said. And we did a party at Christmas, obviously a virtual party. And we had this lovely lady on who had uh, animals in front of her. So she came on and she'd got an edgehog. And before she'd given a list of, you know, resources that they had to have, for the call and one of them was a hairbrush you know I was thinking I was sending this information out to the parents and I just thought goodness me what a what we're going to be doing with a hairbrush so I thought oh well, maybe we're doing some scalp massage or something like that anyway this woman had all these children engage with their hairbrushes pretending it was a hedgehog and feel it and touch it and oh be gentle and hold it bring it a little bit closer to you and it was a hairbrush but the way that she presented and got these children to engage and pretend their hairbrush was a hedgehog and watch their reactions was amazing and then we went on to you know I think it was a toothbrush and you know something else so these were all common household objects but for 20 minutes 
the hairbrush. It was a head jug and it was magical. So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You wouldn't get a parent saying, get the hairbrush out. We're going to play with your head jug today. But actually, the facilitation of that and, you know, the excitement was just, you know, amazing. So absolutely agree, Lucy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Somebody's just asked, Lucy, if you could share maybe in the chat a link to um, a link to the sessions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we've got Amazing. one um, on Saturday if anybody wants to come along. <laughs> Little plug there. <laughs> no, ab go for it. And have you seen a, um, a positive impact for parents during that time of being able to do those sessions? Yeah, I think that it's really that it has been the parents that have really benefited, I think, because it is really, you know, it's really lonely time, isn't it? With um, very, very young children, you know, these sessions are for babies, toddlers and preschoolers, and, and it's been really, really hard for them. And so to just have something that focuses their day and, and sort of structures their day and gives them a little bit of respite has just been so welcome for them. And a lot of people have commented that they really do feel like they're playing together, even though they're apart. So I think yeah, it's been the parents that have, that have really benefited, I think, from and, and sort of, you know, allevi alleviating loneliness that you can feel when you're at home with little ones. Yeah, connection so important, isn't it? And I think, you know, we're social creatures, um, you know, and you can't get away from that as much as alone time is really important. Don't get me wrong. And um, and you've got, you've got to remember that that like, you know, that that's true as well. Um, the, the cumulative effect of not having those moments of connection. Um, I've certainly noticed that since things have, have been relaxed a bit more, I, fi I find that I'm, I end up in these filmic moments quite a lot where I'm walking down the street and, you know, people are smiling at each other. And it's just like, I feel like I'm in a film. And I think when well, it can't all just be that everybody's excited to see me, I think people are genuinely uh, just delighted that there are more opportunities to kind of come across other people um so yeah no I, I'd wondered about that I particularly feel really empathetic for for parents that have had babies in the last year I, my heart really goes out to them I think I just don't know uh, you know at that time is so sensitive anyway you know mm. when you're a new parent and um it occurs to me that it must have been particularly difficult so that's one thing that struck me about your work that was really, really good. I can see we've got a couple of hands up, Lara. So we've got Kate. Is oh, it Katie? Or oh, Kata, sorry if I've not got your name correct. Please join in, contribute. Is it Look Katia? Oh, yeah. Hiya. Sorry, oh, I've hi. not got my glasses on. That's sorry. Good, Don't worry. Um, yeah, so just about the tech thing, I feel like a bit of a naysayer to say what I'm about to say, but I'd be really interested to know what other people think about this. Because I found about maybe six, seven years ago when I first started working as a music therapist in hospital settings, I used the iPad loads in sessions. I used to use loads of music apps, garage band loads, loads of different, different things, and had some really fantastic sessions with it. And it was a really great way of engaging kids who were perhaps a little bit less sure, this and that. I find now I use the iPad hardly ever, or much, much less than I ever used to. And the reason for that, I think, it's because in that time, though it's only, you know, five or six years, maybe seven years, I'm not sure, um, kids have become so much more used to using iPads that back then it was something, it was a bit of a novelty that I was able to bring in and something they were kind of curious about and intrigued. And now I find the amount of time that a child will spend engaging in one particular app or program, they might want to look at it for you know, two and a half minutes, and then they'll go, what other, do, What games do you have? Like, what else do you have on here? And I really struggle with engagement using technology, whereas conversely, I don't really struggle with engagement at all through just using live music and, like, non-technological things, which I find kind of fascinating because everything we're taught to believe about kids now is that they'll engage with stuff much more on the computer. So I'm sort of interested to know if anybody else has that experience. I know Emma's got her hand up, but I just wanted to chip in quickly that um, now you mention it, our play specialist on the renal ward, you know, where they have children coming back two or three times a week, every week, 
um, just recently said to me actually that some of the kids now are refusing to do online sessions. They just they just won't have it. Um, and I think it's, it is becoming a bit intense uh, for them. Um, thank you, Katia. Emma, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, we've um, had sort of ups and downs running our YouTube Makers and YouTube Bakers Club, which started before the pandemic um, and very much sort of aimed at older children from like seven to sort of 11, really. Um, and the idea being that lots of parents were very concerned about their sort of children's use of YouTube and wanted to be influencers and lots of pestering around, I want to have my own account. So we sort of said, well, actually, you know, I don't know if any of you remember when you were younger wanting to make TV programmes. I think that there's always that desire to make your own content. We're like, why don't we create a platform which allows for them to kind of work out what it is they actually want to make in terms of content, but focus on making and playing and then them showing us how to make things. So flipping that pedagogy a bit, really, of going, actually, they are experts at slime. We're not. <laughs> so, or whatever the thing is that they love doing. And so as a result, um, we, it's meant to make easier to facilitate, in fact, when you put yourself in the position of the learner, which is mm. you show yeah. us your world, teach us how to do it, and then you don't have to come up with all the answers, ultimately. So um, a, a very personal anecdote for this is my daughter um, has gone through love and hate of Minecraft. And again, with the pandemic, it became a massive thing again for her and her friends to pick it back up again. And so we started a regular Thursday thing where she, it's called Kids Teach, Tech, Kids, Kids Teach Adults. And she created, because she knows how to use technology in a way I couldn't, little tutorials where she humiliates me basically. <laughs> she teaches me how to make something in Minecraft and I fail every single time. And that became the conceit of it really. <laughs> And uh, then I heard other people say, oh, we've done similar at home because our kids know more about Minecraft than we could ever possibly. So I guess in a sort of, um, it, you know, the platform exists still as YouTube Makers Club and it is really a safe space. It's not about showing your face and being an influencer. It's how do you edit? How do you cut? How do you think about content? How do you work collaboratively? Um, how do you, you know, and then we can have the conversations around safe online digital experiences, um, citizenship, all those kinds of things through, you know, actually making content and people can kind of play to their strengths as well. You know, young people might not, you know, stop animation, making stuff, whatever it is they fancy. We don't really care. We just want to create that space for them to, it wasn't the same um, sort of facilitating it through Zoom. It didn't have the same physical kind of excitement, I think, as when we were all in a physical space together where yeah. people sparked off each other quite differently. Yeah. So we did notice that. And I suppose, I suppose the sort of guiding principle we've got is let kids show you their world. Mm -hmm. And don't try and, you know, teach them everything because ultimately they're going to know so much more. Not so they're all yeah. digital natives, but yeah. they love to they love to teach you. Lovely, Emma. We've got a couple of hands up, but before we move to that, I just want to tell you that I got super excited because obviously, you know, for many years, the first question a child will say to you is, have you got an Xbox? Have you got a PlayStation 4? Have you got an iPad? Mm -hmm. All those working in hospital will get this because, you know, we get a lot of that. Well, we were very excited over lockdown because for young people, and Nikki will get this, um, I'm sure as will a lot of you, um, one of our most popular attended um, activities for young people was our baking activities, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Not the gaming ones, the baking ones. So I see that as a big win. And actually children have started to ask for jigsaws. Mm. Before, many years ago, if I would have said to a child, can I get you a board game or a jigsaw? They would have looked at me as if to say, a board game? A jigsaw? I don't think so. I want PS4. But children, and we've been having a bit of a fun and, you know, laughter around this, have started asking for jigsaws and board games. And we're like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that was quite funny, really. So Isn't that interesting, Lisa? Yeah. So... Anyway, moving on, we've got lots of people with their hands up, so please. Before we go on, I just wanted to highlight in the chat, um, Lucy has done a fantastic blog for the Play Observatory um, project, and I want to encourage everybody to read that blog. Um, and there's also somebody put in the, in the chat about some research about um, uh, VR and real-life play by Dylan... Um, 
Um, and I would point everybody in that direction as well. So who's got the hand up, Lisa? Um, I can see Romy. Oh, Romy. Hi. Hi, I work at Great Ormond Street um, as a healthcare specialist. Um, and I just, I was listening to you, Lisa, and Kat, I've listened to all of you, but um, just what resonates with me a lot with what Katia said. And then Lisa said something quite similar is that um, for the use of iPads, certainly with my interaction with children, I very rarely use. They not, they don't need the health play specialist to use an iPad as distraction. They've got the, that's their own distraction. So I agree mm. that we're the novelty now rather mm. than the, uh, digital world so and also it's about playing with another person isn't it mm -hmm. so it's not obviously um as a play specialist we may not get the time to do the play but if we can it's the the one-to-one -one play is very special to um get that relationship uh, i often apologize when i take toys in and go i'm sorry i'm not going to be the you know mum or your carer will and i hope to come back and play with you because that is where the interaction um, interaction is really special. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of distraction, I use everything except an iPad, actually. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say, and I'm not sure whether um, I am hoping this relates. Um, my daughter in the lockdown, uh, in the freezing cold winter that we've had for very many months, her mm -hmm. digital play, of course, there was all the roadblocks and playing with friends online. But there was situations where she had one particular friend and I don't believe they had to know each other very well because they didn't see each other for three years. They had similar toys. So let's say it's fluffy toys or Sylvanian. And I'm wondering whether this idea could work in the long term patients wards where we speak to two different families and basically they had a FaceTime play date. Um, so they would be in their, um, for example, Emilia in her own home and the other child in their home. And it was as if they were face to face playing with each other with their toys and I'm just wondering and it worked and it wasn't about the relationship they had three day, years ago when they went to school together. It was about having similar toys or I suppose as professionals we would pick up that two kids on a ward are quite similar and could play similarly together and we set them both up with similar toys. Obviously they can't be fluffy toys but other things and I'm just wondering where I've never seen that and it occurred to me only through this session we're doing now whether it, that is a possibility for the future thank you thank you so much Romy I wonder if anybody wants to come back on that and, and does have experience of of similar um similar sessions anybody because I know that with our charity partner spread a smile we've matched up two patients similar age both of whom in the middle of the pandemic um, were feeling you know pretty sort of disconnected from other children and a a, a similar um uh like play date was organized you know so that they're so that they were able to be in the same room yeah. with each other in a facilitated way anybody else got any stories like that hi it's jody um hey, jody I might be talking about something that I did and if not something similar. Um, I've had a, a couple of sessions now where um, I had a, a young girl who um, is infectious so she you know she can't be mingling with other children on the ward um, even COVID. She had become friendly with a patient who was discharged and came back to the hospital but came back to a different ward um, and they were like oh we can we can let them have a play session come on just like a one-off and I was like I just can't, I can't let them mix, but it's okay. We're going to do something else. So the play worker on the other ward and I, um, on my ward, set up the exact same baking tray. Interestingly, uh, both both uh, girls present with autistic tendencies that meant that they liked things very particular. So each tray was like just laid out beautifully. So the, the biscuits, the icing, the sprinkles were in the exact same place trays and we had this zoom session where we you know um did the same activity and it worked really well I didn't know how it was going to work but it, it did go really well and like Laura said um I have also done some joint work with spread a smile um so this was actually the same patient but um, allowing her to develop some social skills with another child of a similar age with similar interests 
um, on a totally different ward who she's never met in person. Um, and it, it's worked wonderfully well. Yeah, it's been great. Ah, oh, thank you, Jodie. Just following on from that, which is quite interesting, we Thanks, did an Jody. engagement event with children and young people. And one of the suggestions that came from one of the children there, which I think is a great suggestion, mm -hmm. again, there are the best ideas, was that they would like a screen from the cubicles that they could switch on and off if they wanted to play with the child next door. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, because, you know, we're so in hospital infection, IPC is everything. But actually, wouldn't that be nice if that, you know, you wanted to talk and interact next door, you could change the glass to clear, and then obviously, if you're having some invasive treatments or you're not in the mood for play, you can switch it off. And I just thought, wow, that's such a simple thing, which I hope, you know, our designers are going to take forward and embed into the new build because it gives, you know, the child a bit more choice. And that, um, you know, for our isolated children, I think that's really important. Absolutely. But kids do have the best ideas, don't they? They do, they do. Yeah, Sim so simple, but but novel. And actually, you've just got to listen. Um, that's um, like, you know, Jodie, thank you so much for sharing those examples. Absolutely. And like these, these common themes, sorry for, cut, for cutting you off, Lisa. These, these common themes about the importance of connection. And it's interesting. So Bev, you talked about thinking about the novelty wearing off. Um, of digital and screen time um, but what is it that you know with these with kids playing with more jigsaws what is it and I would say that it's the need for connection the searching for connection and actually that physical presence of somebody where you're not having to guess what is the mood in the room because you can just feel it um, do you remember when we all started zooming and we were feeling exhausted and thinking like, why are we so exhausted? And, and I felt like it was because I'm constantly trying, my senses, my feelers are going out to try to feel like, oh, what is the mood in the room? And I couldn't get it because there's nobody actually there. So you're constantly sort of trying to generate this information and understand the data, but you can't because yet that, that wavelength is not there. Um, and so that's what occurs to me that actually what kids are saying is that they want that feeling they want the feeling of somebody real there lovely thank you we've got a couple of hands up um i'm sorry if i pronounce your name wrong is it elevin evelyn it's okay um i just actually wanted to leap back to what emma said a little while ago about um um you know like uh different types of creative types of digital engagement and just sort of like given an example of i um had a meeting with someone who does storytelling for us through read for good and he said something really interesting that he a project that he was working on funded by a cancer charity at a, a children's hospital in bristol hospital in bristol um of an oncology patient and his brother they were twin twin brothers and they want want to set up like a storytelling sort of podcast and he was going to facilitate that for them so he was going to come in for a series of visits and sort of use his skills as a storyteller he also has a podcast bring in you know a microphone and and stuff and just sort of like help them develop this thing so just from that as well it's like digital engagement and creative digital engagement doesn't always equal screen time they're not using a screen really to to do that but they are doing something digital <laughs> um so so sort of the definition of it is is really broad and, and it can mean all sorts of things um and then just as a second thing from that um, we were thinking about doing a project with something called micro bits, if, if people want to look it up, um, that we were going to start doing uh, in the summer holiday with our um, uh, patients on our Mildred Creek unit, which is a mental health unit. And it's like a sort of it's a physical um, I'm so bad at describing it because I'm not very techie, but it's a physical thing um, and you plug it into a computer or link it up with your computer and then you code, you get a coding program and then you can make the micro bit do things so you can make it light up, you can make it like make music and noises and it's this physical thing so they don't have to like 
you know, it actually, when they do something, something happens. It's not all happening just online. Something is actually sort of coming from it. Um, and it's quite playful and interesting. Um, so I just wanted to flag up micro bits as a potential um, for anybody who was interested in that sort of work. And that's it. Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. Claire, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just thought I might quickly um, mention, I've been um, chatting with Laura. Um, I work at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. And while we're talking about digital, um, I took part in the session that Emma organized. Um, we're using robots, um, telepresence robots. And at the moment, Laura and I are talking about whether we can use these robots to allow children to um, explore things like HMS Victory, which is our one of our historic ships. Um, so the idea is that they can control the robot from the hospital, choose what they see, choose where they go, um, talk to us, ask us things, um, and have control over it themselves. Um, so it's very in the very, very early stages. Yep, that's Ross, he's fantastic. Um, and um, he's really keen to, to kind of see how his inventions can be used to uh, kind of increase access and to help people. Um, so once we've actually um, got our robot and we've tried it out, hopefully it's gonna work and we can then start these little mini robot. We're turning it into a rat, hopefully a robot rat to run around the uh, ships. Um, and the idea is the kids can then pick and choose what they see and um, and kind of explore somewhere that they may not have a chance to kind of go to um, either for geographic reasons or because they obviously are in hospital and it's tricky to do that. So um, I'm hoping that that means we'll have a bit more of a, a fun use of technology as well. So yeah, I'm, fingers crossed that works out. I have to say, That's I'm so excited fabulous. by that, Claire. That that is like made my day, knowing <laughs> that Ross's robot jousting event, which we did through Zoom, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, it was. It worked really well. I've it's had it on the. Fun. I have had a robot on the ship, but he's making me one with better a uh, track, because the wheels are tricky on a 250 year old ship. I, mean, I just love the fact you've gone off and created this new thing with him as well. So I know that I would sing Ross's praises from the highest. He's been brilliant. He's so helpful. He's an inventor and an engineer, and his whole thing is about inclusive design, actually. And so this Smarty Bot is one of the products he's created. But he's like a proper genius, actually. I don't say that about everybody. He really is. So look him up, Ross Atkin, um, Smarty Bot, and it's this. It's just wonderful. And it really gives you this sense of scale, doesn't it? Because these telepresence robots are about sort of skirting board height, really. So yeah. it's sort of, you, you sort of navigate the space by controls and it's almost like you're little again. So it's quite... It's yeah, quite that's why we're going down the robot ramp route. We think we quite like the idea of exploring, kind of going underneath things and going into little corners that you don't normally get to see. I absolutely love that. Absolutely love it. And do you know what? My mind's ticking away now because we do a project called Harvey's Gang where the children obviously go into the labs and things like that. And it helps with the preparation and understanding of having blood tests and important sort of, you know, um, procedures. But can you imagine if we could have something like that going into departments as part of our preparation um, you know, for, for procedures and things, right? Well, before we go to that department, you can visit him on our little robot. Oh my God, that would be amazing. He's so amazing. Cool, I mean, I know we're sort of sadly now slightly past two o'clock, which I'm sure for some that will be like, oh, I've got to go back to work. Um, and I don't know how Lisa and Laura are fixed, but um, it's a little suggestion because Ross, Ross is a very amenable person. Um, <laughs> we could ask him maybe for the next meetup if he could do like a little he, he did it in his workshop room for the jousting robots and uh, it's just a really good demonstration really of how you can be at home playing a game with robots somewhere else so maybe we should twist his arm a little bit to, for the next meetup so i think that sounds, yeah. that sounds brilliant yeah absolutely yeah okay oh, vicky i can see you've got your hand up i'm sorry yeah. you've sat yeah. patiently so please yeah. do contribute thank you can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Lower my hand. Uh, it was just in uh, response to what is it Evelyn was saying about the micro bits. And in at Leeds Nightlight, um, 
a few years ago, the Leeds Library Microbit Co Club did an installation where they got primary, well, we did it as a primary school. So we bought like a club. So we got 30 kids to program 30 microbits. And in the end, I think through the, through the code club and other people, they ended up with kind of about 200 microbits. And the, the code was one, it made me think about what you were saying about communicating with kids that can't communicate because they can't be together. The code, like you set it off on one and then it talked to all of the others. So it set off a chain reaction. So it was a very simple bit of code that kids that were like seven could learn and program themselves. And then all these microbits talk to all these other microbits. And I was suddenly thinking that maybe if you did something with that, then certainly you could get kids talking, coding something on one and it would be going back and forth with the other, which I know you can do with text. <laughs> like you can do it already on a smartphone, but the idea that they're actually coding it themselves, I think they enjoy that part. So that is so exciting because not only, yes, you could just be texting it or WhatsApping it, but it's the other element of actually you're, you're forming new neural pathways because you're, you know, you're learning without realising that you're learning as you go along. I just absolutely am so excited about that. I can ask, I can ask the, it's the same people that Emma knows that run the code club, I'm sure. We could ask them what the code was and um, how that could be applicable. We could, it, we, I'm sure there would be, code club people that I, I could talk to or others could talk to that that would be able to yeah produce something or or share the intelligence bit to make that work that would be that would be amazing thank you because I think um for for the for the people on the call who who do work with children in hospital it is a real fear of mine actually that um, though when children have conditions and they have and they're dealing with illnesses they miss out on exposure to a lot of stuff a lot of just the run of the mill stuff that would happen anyway um, the after school clubs the things that are going on at school because we know that children who have chronic conditions miss school it's it's underreported we don't have any stats about it but we know it happens and so that really normal exposure to things like coding in a in a sort of everyday and fun way is missing. And I think that um, any way that we can get it into the kind of fabric of, of kids' days when they're in hospital, I think is a real, um, is a really great thing, you know, so that it's not, it doesn't feel like you're sort of slogging through learning something that's quite sort of tricky and di disconnected from everyday life, but actually making it something that is about communicating and is about creating and, and is about, play brilliant oh You're absolutely right laura because I, th I do think sometimes when we read the sort of negative stories about digital and technology it's quite often about passive consumption of or too much screen time and actually the reality is there are so many wonderful ways in which kids can be creative with technology and um maybe you know that's that's maybe what uh, the theme of next one could be is like examples of where young people have creatively hacked technology, made their own stuff. There's inventors out there. There's loads of amazing stories of, you know, young people coming up with awesome uses for technology, as well as, you know, how do we connect bits of the system together better? So like if Leeds Libraries can work with Leeds Children's Hospital, for example, they love that kind of stuff. They, they're just waiting for the opportunity quite often. So sometimes it's just making those little connections between people who want to work with each other but don't know there's a need. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. So are we going to wind it up? That's the big question. <laughs> I mean, I'm on holiday, so I've got all day. <laughs> I, I think, Laura, we've got Kate just put a... Oh, no, she's gone. Sorry, I thought you put your hand up, but I think it was your thumb, Kate. So that's great. Thank you. So, yeah, I think we need to let Laura get back to her holidays. She's in sunny Cornwall. <laughs> she needs to make every second count while she's there because she'll be back at work soon. Soon enough. <laughs> so, you know, i just like to say thank you very much to everybody that joined. I hope it's been useful. We welcome contributions and thank Emma for chairing and organising and keeping us all in line today. Any suggestions, please zap them over to Emma. And, you know, um, from me and I'll let Laura and Emma finish. Thank you very much. It's been great.
Oh, thank Lisa, you so much, thank, Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, thank you everybody for, for attending and making such a rich and exciting session. Emma. Well, I think um, there always seems to be an appetite for more. So we'll just assume that we'll keep putting things on until nobody turns up. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> sounds the other good. way around. Um, so if you do have suggestions of, you know, ideas or you want to speak, you know, there's, you know, if there's anything you want to showcase, I know that um, Kate's been doing some awesome stuff, which I think she's put notes about in the chat. But again, you know, revisiting some of the um, digital stuff might be, let's have a 10 minute chat with people who are experts in those fields. So see it as your opportunity as well to sort of take the stage and the spotlight if it would be helpful to you for future. And yeah. uh, is just keep, I, I don't always feel comfortable to do that thing of like, shall we send each other's detail? Because what happens between events, I guess, is um, how you want to keep in contact with each other rather than us being the sort of main, I don't know, gatekeeper of information. So perhaps make sure before we finish, if you really want to be kept in contact with, you stick it in the chat mm -hmm. and then people can contact you with each other directly. Uh, and so thank you once more for everybody joining over this lunchtime. Thanks, Laura and Lisa and everybody here. And uh, see you in about two months' time, maybe. What do you think? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. that sounds Lovely. good to me. Go Lovely to see play. you all. <laughs> it's a summer of play now. There's no excuses. I'm, I'm going to challenge you all to do something with chalk. Do anything with chalk and put love to play 2021 on your hashtag. Or in the stand, Laura. You just, rem I, I will do it in the sand, but you just reminded me, I am, um, we are having a, um, if all goes to plan, we're having a play street on the 4th of August on Great Ormond Street. And um, we have been concocting this kind of aspiration to leave the whole street covered in chalk drawings and, and, and phrases. So that is, um, that is something I'd be looking forward to hopefully being able to share if we're meeting after August. Yeah, brilliant. So let's take pictures between now and then and make our streets the most colourful, vibrant, wonderful places. That is our challenge amongst us all. And I think the, the, the thing that really strikes me every time we talk is how we need to sort out play spaces outside of hospitals. Yeah. Like where there isn't. So maybe there's a national campaign we need to do for that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we should get somebody from Play England to come and, to come and join us next time. Definitely, that's a good idea. Let's put that in our things to do. I'm going to stop recording now.